record. And it always tells me we're recording in progress. So uh, welcome everyone. It's a uh, it's lovely to to see so many people here on a, on a uh, sunny Sunday evening. Um, we're hoping that uh, that a few more people may be popping in to join us, but if not, that's okay too. It's it's a lovely cozy group we've got going here. So my name is Terry Moore. I'm the executive director of the Souk Fine Arts. Society, and it's my pleasure to be here uh, this evening. As we begin, I'd like to respectfully acknowledge that um, the, the Souk First Nation on whose land that we gather in celebration of the arts. Uh, just a few housekeeping things, as I mentioned, we will uh, be muting everybody, but we certainly don't want to discourage any kind of conversation. So we will have some time at the end set aside to ask questions and have Phyllis answer. Um, anything, any questions you might have. I, I will also say if you are feeling uncomfortable about being on camera, please feel free to turn off your, turn off your uh, video portion if you want, but we're happy to have you on camera as well. Um, today's talk is called The Magic of Photography Without a Camera. So I'm really curious to hear what this is all about and how that's going to work. Um, the official description of the talk is that the magic of photography without a camera is talking about the lumen print process. So that's photograms made without a camera. And it's an image making process that Phyllis will explain and illustrate with examples. Um, Phyllis Schwartz will explain the history of the early photographic experiments that led to her own uh, discovery and artistic practice, and she will show how photograms of plant materials leave marks and traces on photosensitive surfaces and how she crafts them in a digital medium. So I'd like to introduce Phyllis. Phyllis is a, is a multidisciplinary artist now based in Victoria, who works in photography, ceramics, and publishing. Her work at Emily Carr University consolidated these interests with a concentration in photography. She was the recipient of the Canon Photography Award. And as a visual artist, she seeks detail, texture, and poetic elements in her work. She uses photography to investigate and record what eludes the eye. Her photography has been exhibited and published across Canada and internationally. Her works are, are in public, corporate, and private collections everywhere. And now, Phyllis, I will turn it over to you. Well, thank you, Terry. Um, it's an honor to be here, and uh, it's nice to be with a gathering of people who are interested in art. It's been a, a long, well, I, I was explaining to Terry when COVID became um, real for us, um, we, um, my husband is also an artist, we had been on quite a lot of exhibition um, projects, and we were kind of grateful to kind of pack up everything and we declared it a sabbatical and I went back and took some courses and it's been exciting to to rethink some of my artwork and to have some new directions so a little bit I mean most of my bio is was was was, was read there um, I'm a multimedia artist um, I um, I've been making photographs since I was seven my mother packed a camera into whatever I took to camp. And I found that process of looking through a lens fascinating. I even, I love, it was like Christmas when the film came back from the photography store and I could see what my pictures looked like. And then you could only take 12 or eight. And so photographs were much more precious and much more thought out. But um, it was it was an amazing process that has stuck with me through all the iterations of uh, the little box cameras and then the instamatics with the cartridges. And, and then in the 70s, everybody was buying a, you know, a real camera. And, and I started to do darkroom work. And uh, so photography is just part of everything that I do. I'm also a ceramic artist, so because I really like to work with my hands. So through this digital evolution, um, I'm always happy to get back to making my work handmade. So, um, and um, I'm not sure what else to say, uh, except that I've been showing my work and I've been doing um, guest teaching, which I really enjoy being in, in classrooms and I've missed that the most during COVID. So I'm sure it'll come back, but um, I'm not sure when, uh, and I'm looking forward to that. 
Okay, so for today, what I would like to do is I want to talk about where my interest in lumen prints got started and how I worked with analog photography and that just through the experimentation of working with materials, um, I discovered some work in, um, in the digit that could be transported into digital. And I want to explain how that kind of slippage happened. And then I want to talk about two pieces of my, um, my artist practice. So I guess my, my slideshow, we could probably have the agenda up. Okay. Sure slide. Just the, there we go. Get this into um, big mode here. Yeah. There we are. Yeah. So the piece that's in the show is this one. And we'll talk Oops, about great. that. <laughs> okay. and Do you want I'm me to back up a little bit? Pardon? Did you want me to back up? So yes, please. That was great when you had, yeah, yeah. No, no. Um, oh. Go to the next slide. Next slide. Oh, there we go. Yeah, and um, uh, and I'll talk about two pieces that of the style of my work or the interests of my work, which is pareidolia, and I'll explain what that is later. And that um, I I tend to describe describe myself as an abstract artist. And then at the end, I'll leave time for questions. So moving to the next. Um, so lumen prints are, are what are called unique photograms, and I'll break those two terms down. Um, unique obviously means there's one of, and so when I make a, a photograph, I make it from a negative, and so I can make multiples. But when I make a photogram on photo paper, that's it. That is the only one, unless I scan it, and then it's a derivative, not, not a, a unique piece. So. Um, if it's a good one and someone likes it, it's really a precious piece of work because if it's gone, it's gone. And unless there's a photograph of it, there's no more traces. And as I said, it's simply made by laying material on photosensitive paper and exposing it to light. And we'll go to the next piece. And so it's made by, it's, it's a contact print. So what's on the paper, what's on the paper will be uh, copied by the photosensitive. So this is really the underside of the shrimp. And because they're symmetrical, we think it's the top of the shrimp. Um, and so um, that's, how, that's how it's made. If I put an orange there, it captures the underside of the, the orange slice. If I put a shrimp or a prawn down, it captures the underside. So there's a little bit of planning that happens when I do, do layout. Okay, what's next? Um, and so the other thing that is very important in, um, in the work is that um, lighting makes a huge difference in the way the work you know, comes to happen and atmospheric conditions. And so I could have the same lighting, but different atmosphere, different moisture, um, and um, even a different slant of light for the same amount of time will, will change the way it interacts with, um, with the paper. And so um, this is a, uh, a piece of bull kelp. Uh, wrapped around some bladder wrap. Those are two seaweeds. And um, usually when you make photograms, you make a, like a sandwich, you put your work on the, the, the photosensitive paper, you put a piece of plexi or a piece of glass to keep things in place and also to make it just like when you're making an x-ray, it is pressed really close to your skin so that you get a direct contact and you, the, the x-ray can go through your through your skin and bones. Um, so this was too, um, too three-dimensional for me to lay anything on. And so what you had was you had, um, you had the light walking around any of the places that were lifted. Um, and so you can see the, the end of the, the um, bull kelp. Um, is like a like photographing. Um, same thing will happen with an egg yolk. It'll the light will walk all the way around it if you leave it out in the sun for the full cycle of the sun, like twenty four hours. And so this was also a rainy weekend that I was making these prints, and so the rain was interacting with the silver, which is what's in the photo paper. It's a silver gelatin print, and so it was really tarnishing the silver. 
And then where it's pink, that's where it made the most contact with, um, with the paper. And so over all the experiments, I've learned how to approximately get certain colors. So we'll go to the next. Phyllis, can I ask, is this uh, presentation set to automatically move to the next no, slide? I didn't do that. Okay. All right. Well, we'll see if it stops yeah. on this okay. time. I'll be ready for it. If Sorry. It does. I, I just, I'm not that high tech. So like, <laughs> okay. Well, so, yeah. So there what we go. this is, this is an <laughs> overview of um, three and a half of the stages of a lumen print. On the far left top corner is the layout. And there were wet tea bags. Um, this composition of wet tea bags and a spoon. Um, and the pink is where the water from the tea bag started to froth and work into the, the paper. And it got, it penetrated the layer and the photo paper is a sandwich and it's blue, pink, pink, purple and yellow. And so it had gotten into the second layer. And so I let it set up for a couple of hours under indoor lights, took it off, took off the objects. And you can see the spoon completely um, prevented any light going through. It was an overhead light. And you can see the two lights, those two lights in the, the this triangle and that oval. And then you can see that the tea actually stained the paper. You can tell it's sort of an orange Pico tea, but it, it stained the paper um, a certain amount. Um, and some people who make lumen prints will make sure that they photocopy this piece of the um, uh, this piece of the lumen print process and maybe even make that their print. And so I did that just to show you what some people are doing with their lumen prints. They would have figured out how to dodge out those lights or they would have prevented those lights. And then on the far bottom right is what the lumen print looks like. It's more on the pink side than on the brown side or the green side, because this was a short exposure and it didn't fully um, develop all the, um, the dye layers. And you can see some of the orange walked out. So we'll move on. And then where this, well, maybe, maybe I'll just take a couple of questions about how it's made, because I'm not gonna talk more about that. Um, we'll just go back to that how it's made slide. And if anybody wants to ask a brief question about the how to, um, I'd be happy. To... Um, just a moment here and I will unmute everybody. So I see that, uh, I see somebody had a hand up there. Go ahead, please. Hi. Yeah. Um, is it my turn? <laughs> yes, go ahead, please. Okay. Yeah, I would like to know what kind of paper to get. Oh, well, good question. Really important question. Um, I'm using, you can do, most photo paper now is what's called RC, which means resin coated, but I am using a fiber-based paper, the old traditional photo paper that, from the time it was invented. And um, the only thing you can really get your hands on is Ilford. When I first started, the word on the street was to use old paper that hadn't been you know, that had been around for 20 years. And, and I actually prefer to work with a paper that I can predict. And so I found a couple of papers that, um, that really work for me. Um, but it's, it's a, a, a fiber-based paper, um, produces the better results. If you want really quick results, you can work with resin coated, but it won't give you the sharpness and it won't pick up as much of the the warm details um, that a fiber-based paper can. And how Does do that you know help? When it's done? Okay, okay. So um, people are always trying to say who was the first of something or other, and so there was there's the the photographers haven't decided who made the first photograph, whether it was William Henry Fox Talbot or Anna Atkins, but Anna Atkins' father was a friend of Fox Talbot. And Anna was a, a, a botanist in her own right. And she was very interested in figuring out 
a way of getting scientific notation without having to spend a, an elaborate amount of time making field drawings. And so she was very interested in a, using a photographic process to map the specimens that she was dragging out of. Um, she lived at the south of England. I can't remember if it was Cornwall or Kent, but she was dragging out seaweed samples and she wanted to lay them out. And she actually moved on, she moved away more from what we know as photography, more into cyanotypes, which was blueprinting. And so she made just a ton of early botanical photographs using this blueprint process. So this is where the photography that we know came from. It came from botanists wanting a shortcut. And Henry Fox Talbot was much more interested in the chemistry of the paper. So the two of them together contributed to the photograph that we know. We'll go on to the next picture. Okay. And there's, there's me just experimenting with you know, the first apple is more scientific notation. And then I started to think, how can I be a little more playful? Because I was doing, you know, wanting to see what else you could do with just making these forms. I hadn't quite figured out my direction yet. And again, it's purple because it's indoor lighting, uh, window lighting, overhead lighting, and short exposures. So like I said, you know, the, you can tell what stage of the paper development by the, the color. So, and the apple itself has enzymes and acids that would interact with the silver. And so you're starting to get some of the silver and some of the dye that makes the paper what's called warm or cold. So next slide. Actually, I have a question for you. Sure. Uh, when you say you, you give it a short exposure, how long is that short exposure? Um, it has to be a good two hours or you don't get anything. You'll oh. get a white piece of paper. Um, but it's really much better to do six or eight hours. And that one I showed you of the bulk help, that was two days. Oh. And the longer it goes, the paper will reach a point of no return, um, but uh, the longer it goes, the more detail it will pick up. Okay, thank you. And so here's something I was doing in the desert. And again, um, I was in a, a travel mode. So I was in a, a, a hotel or, or place where there was a kitchen. And so I knew I was going to make prints and I went through the cupboards and you could see that in the corner, there's a little kind of curve in the picture. That's where I've placed a storage, you know, like a glass storage, food storage thing uh, to keep the bougainvillea pressed closer to the paper. So the other way that people think of lumen prints is they think of them as as having x-ray qualities where they actually press up against and then they they penetrate through the you know the light penetrates to copy or imitate the, the shapes of the tissues so it it's unlike a photograph that i would take in a you know with a camera um, i'm kind of penetrating the surface of what i'm photographing okay next and so i'll start to talk about a few of the artists that i met or researched um, as influencing my work. So, so Adam Foos is a, um, um, he does a lot of really interesting work with a camera in a studio, but he's very interested in shadow catching and making photographs is so that you can get yourself beneath it into kind of the shadow or the subconscious level of, um, what he's photographing. And so uh, he was very interested in making a sense that there was something inside of these christening gowns. Mm -hmm. And uh, he tries to make visible what's superficially invisible. And the next is um, the surrealists, the Dada uh, artists. They're important to me because the three names at the bottom are the artists who experimented with the photogram. And the photogram, unlike um, a photograph, is the, whatever is being photographed is pressed against the paper. So when you make a contact sheet, that's basically a photogram um, or a contact print. 
And so by accident, Man Ray was in, uh, no, Christian Shad was in the lab and he was cleaning up and he had a few things on the enlarger surface and um, he didn't realize that he had a piece of paper still there. And I don't know, he turned on the light, realized there was paper, turned it right off and realized that he had photographed both the shadows and the marks of the object right on the paper. And you can imagine when something like that happens in a studio, everybody is like, how'd you do that? And why'd you do that? What else can you do? So again, one of those horse race competitions, Christian Shad, I believe published the first um, photogram in about 1920 and Man Ray was about three years later. And what's interesting is he called them shadow graphs and Man Ray called them rayograms. Mm -hmm. And, you know, eventually they became photograms because, you know, we were moving on from that kind of naming. So what happens is the photogram will pick up a three dimensional quality. So you not only got the bottom of the beaker but you've got the shadow of the beaker. This is cloth and you can sort of see that he's picking up the layers. So the next slide, that brown one. Yes, sorry. Is another one that was from that series when I, you saw that um, bull kelp. That was also out in the rain for a couple of days. Um, that may have been covered and um, the water would have pooled um, because it was one of those Vancouver rainy weekends. and. When I was processing that, I just kind of looked down and then new pieces of my artist practice emerged. I looked down and it was the first time I realized that I saw something that looked a bit like a goat and maybe a kid. And I just started to say, oh, are those, are those hooves? And is that goat moving around? You know, are his feet moving so much that he's a white blur? And are those eyes there? And is that a little nose and a mouth? And so I started to realize that there was a subconscious level that I couldn't control. And then I started looking for that in um, my compositions. So we'll look at the next. And um, the father of the lumen print is Jerry Birchfield. He was working at the University of Southern California. And I thought, oh goody, as soon as I graduate, I'm gonna try to figure out a way to go and talk to him or work with him. He had published these beautiful lumen prints of plants from the Amazon rainforest. And for some reason he had a boat. He had gone down there by boat or something. And he was processing these on the boat. He had his assistants taping the paper to the hull of the boat. And then he would take them into the studio and he would tone them to amplify some of the colors. Well, Jerry Birchfield died before he could help more people. And so I felt, oh no, now I'm on my own to, to really, but his book, Primal Images, is worth having a look and a read. And it, it inspired me to um, realize that there is something secondary in a photograph that isn't just the, the shape on the paper, but there's something about our, our existence that's in, in what we read into the work, especially if we're working with live things. So moving on. Um, so here, this is also from that series where the goat and the, the bull kelp, and it's, um, it's the top of the, the piece of seaweed and just the way it fell on the paper, I started to see, and I actually call this something like a heart. And I started to see that it was like, to me, I could read it as something like a heart. And I started to realize that what I was doing was deconstructing the organic and reconstructing um, something compositionally that I didn't have full control over and that the process itself was gonna contribute. And so that's where I still am now is that I set this up and then um, the sun and the wind and the rain um, and just the chemistry all are part of my artist practice and in some ways, I'm the choreographer, so next. Um, and then this is, this is part of it. Um, this, this was probably later in the summer. Um, and um, 
it's you can tell it's dry because the, it's not as quite as tarnished, but the the the, the plants itself give off a certain amount of moisture um, that work into the paper and do a little bit of tarnishing, but you can tell the wet from the dry. And so then I start out, if anybody can see that in the, under the, I'm pointing at a screen you can't see, but anyway, there's a um, kind of a, what I see is a little pair of closed eyes and probably a little infant in there. And I started to see, you know, that there's a, a chrysalis there of some sort. And that's when I discovered the next piece of what I, you know, these, these indexical marks, um, you could read it literally that there's bladder rack and there's um, sea lettuce and there's debris, but there's also something else. And pareidolia is about looking into a work to see other works. And I'm gonna talk about that in much more detail um, in about five slides or, or more. Okay, next. And so when I talk about, this is kind of the summation, this is later on that summer. Um, I, this is um, a piece, I'd, I was doing other work as well and I had some bananas that I'd sliced and I wanted to see what would happen with what banana would do. To, and I left it out overnight and I came back and the raccoons had just totally reconstructed my, my um, my dark, my outdoor dark room. Um, and um, so whatever I had laid out there, this is not a banana piece, it's a seaweed piece, but the raccoons had actually were able, looking for, for bananas everywhere, had moved some of the, the plexi plates and had started to kind of move around the seaweed. So um, it ended up looking like that rather than what my original layout may have been. Um, so I just wanted to, to say that, that I'm always open for that. I try right now where I live is very windy and I do clip the work down because I don't really want my material blown everywhere, but um, there's a certain amount of randomness I'm still open to. Okay, we can look at the next. So now some projects that I've been doing with my Lumen printing. What attracts me to this is it's a really portable process. So um, I don't even take my materials across the border and that way I don't have to say anything about, you know, what is this chemicals in your car and what are you doing with all this photo paper? So we'll cross the border, we'll go to a photo store, um, then I'll stop at a, um, a, a store where I can pick up some, some large plastic tubs and I'll figure out how I can, you know, make the photo bath tubs so that I can do this wherever, you know, wherever I am. And so, um, and um, so I got very interested in the Salton Sea and there's, the Salton Sea is pretty well um, the border between California and Mexico. And um, on one side of it is a lot of, industry that we use like the computer industry a lot of uh, a lot of vegetables are grown there and um all of this uh all of these all of this trash um jumps through the colorado river and i got very interested in going there because it's a dead sea so the next slide and so i started to go down there and pick up um, the, some of the dead fish and the debris that was on the shore because I was very interested in what that might reveal. So those are tilapia um, and also just bones and skeletons. And we'll look at the next slide. And it, there's a bird skull. If you look, I don't know if we can point that out. Um, no, back one. There's a bird skull in this. There's, there's like um, go to the left corner and go up and there's the first little slit. That's kind of the nose. That's where the nose, the air hole is in the nose. But the, I actually, you know, it was a little creepy, but I'd actually picked up a bird skull as well. And so I was very interested in making photograms of this. And the next is the debris I'll show you. 
this is what I picked up and made prints with. And you could see how hot the sun is because the paper is full purple and they, they turn out to be a very rich brown. But I had a lot of this wet and dry and, and made just, I, I went down there one year and took digital photographs and decided to come back and make um, lumen prints with it just to see. And I have shown this in a couple of shows because it's a profound echo disaster. And I worry, you know, anyway. So moving on, the next idea, because I'm interested in, in this primal, these primal issues, is I've started to um, seek out um, uh, the prehistoric plants that are accessible, like ginkgo, fern, pine, and horsetail are near us. So I've done a ginkgo project and I'm interested in the longevity of this. And um, uh, what I had done for my grad project was all seaweed. So I'm, I think deep down I'm interested in um, what's primal and what, what's transformed into the urban technological people that we are. Next. And so here you go on the left is the, the analog and then what I discovered was I could use here. Let's we'll stay on the next slide. Okay. The next one there. What I did was I found a piece of sheet film and I thought, well, what would happen if I found a large, large negative and I processed it like, and lo and behold, it behaved just like the lumen prints, but I could scan them. Next slide. Mm -hmm. And so in the scanner, you have two modes. You have this, the scanner, but you also have color restoration. And so the first one is just scanned. And the third one is color restoration. And then those two and four are the inverted ones. So once I saw that, I thought, what else can I do in my computer? Next slide. And so here's an example of how I worked my way through one of my um, ginkgo projects. So this was a large piece of sheet film with ginkgo and horsetail. And the next slide will show you what it started like. There it is. There's the net, there it is. And then there's it in um, some enhanced negative version. And I started to see things. So a lot of this stuff looks like nothing. And you have to sit with this for sometimes a couple of years till you figure out what you wanna see in it. So next. And so you saw something like that. And then I'll show you the next one. Okay, so there were all my compositional choices. And what was on the left was pretty close to what I finally exhibited. But those were some of the many things. And I was using um, Photoshop. I was using um, uh, Nick software and I was using Lightroom and they all have things that um, will pull the colors or will um, suppress the colors or will work with the shadows only or work with the highlights. And so I was learning things in the programs that um, were having different effects. So I was just like having all kinds of painter tools that I could use with what I had started with. So next. And now here's the story of the piece that's in the show. So let's go to the next slide. So on the left is the negative. And if you look in the kind of the left-hand corner, you'll see a slit and two pointy things. And it took me over a year to see that. And what I did was I turned the piece sideways and that's what I got. And I thought, oh, what can I do with that? So we'll go to the next. And I turned it again and I saw a bird. And then these are some of the iterations um, where I started to um, try to find out, find something aesthetic that I thought made up a photograph um, or, some, or a print that might be show worthy. So that's basically um, what I do is, is I don't really know what I've got until I've explored it for a really long time. Um, 
And I have two more ideas, but I think this is a better place to stop for some technical questions. Okay. Does anybody uh, have any? I have a question, okay. Debbie. Um, Phyllis, so you say that you transition to using um, large sheet negatives. Was your process similar um, of la leaving things out in the sun or, or how did you change your process? No process change, just using sheet film instead of paper. And I still do paper prints because I, I like the, the value of a one of, mm -hmm. but um, I was basically using, uh, and there's a lot of free stuff out there. Just about every high school has a cupboard full of graphics materials. They don't teach that anymore. Um, and I've gotten all kinds of donations of things and it comes large, um, so large that you'd have to build a tub or use your bathtub to process. Like I've found some, um, some sheet film that's, you know, like, because there was, um, these large, in graphics, they were using these large format sheets of, of things to make posters. And the stuff it produces is tack sharp. Wow. To buy it is really expensive, but if you're anywhere near an old high school, you know, a high school that, you know, or you know someone who teaches, that's, people don't usually throw that stuff out. So, but I buy, I mean, again, I buy, she, I buy eight by 10 sheet film. That's my preferred, but I'll explore things. I bought x-ray film. It was really hard as a, you know, not a dentist, um, but I did find a place that would, you know, I could send away for, and I bought some, some Fuji dental, you know, Fuji x-ray film, and you could get it in all kinds of sizes because they make large x-rays for large parts of your body. And what's nice is that has the, the, the photosensitive stuff on both sides. So uh, it wow. gives even more detail. So. Any other questions right now? Yeah. All right, let me know when you want to move okay, on. Okay, so I've got two, two ideas. So the next slide will has this big word, pareidolia, which, um, is um, basically a psychological phenomenon um, that we're, basically we're hardwired to survive. And one of the survival things that hasn't been bred out of us or, or transformed out of us is that we always are looking for eyes. It's very disturbing to look at people with their eyes covered um, because you can't read people without being able to to see their eyes. You can't tell much about your own danger or your own safety without being able to see what people's eyes are doing. You can't tell what emotions, unless you're super, super sensitive to emotions, you can't really tell much about people without seeing their eyes. And so um, the other thing is that we've, we've got this human ability to, to see shapes that make pictures. And so if we know what a, a dangerous animal looks like, um, we might be able to see that in a, a shadowy area. And so we're hardwired for that. Um, so pareidolia is basically being able to see the man in the moon or a dragon in the cloud or a face in the rocks. And um, when we talk about you know danger hiding in the shadows, they're not kidding because you can't really see these things. And you know people who wear hoodies and, and brim caps and, you know, dark glasses are definitely hiding, you know. So um, I got very interested in this primus, you know, primal, you know, primal, primal idea because it was showing up in my work. So this is just three little pieces of seashells, you know, and they're chippy. So there's layers. And then I saw these two pairs of eyes and it looked, you know, and it was just one of those wet pieces. So you can see the pools of water that were picked up on the paper. And this is on sheet film. And to me, it just looked like those little Wookiees that were in those, those um, sci-fi films. But I mean, you don't, but it's just the two little white spots in the dark, um, the dark blobs. And I, all of a sudden I saw something that had like a life form. 
And I thought, you know, this is asking me to look again. And this is asking me to recognize familiar forms. And this is asking me to make personal meaning from ambiguity. So next slide. And so here are some examples of pieces that I've made um, that really point to my interest in finding eyes. And so the one on the left is a digital form. And it, again, that took me a long time to find that half face. And once I did, I just couldn't stop working on it. This one is a rate, the middle one is Chesterman's Beach where I had that really wispy seaweed. And just the way it lay there, it was just like a guy with a big beard and lots of hair. And then I kind of made a couple of spaces for an eye and a mouth and it worked. And again, another Chesterman Beach one um, where all of a sudden I saw it looked like somebody is wearing, there's a little bit of like wireframe glasses. And then I started to read into, and they, the, the, the two, the middle and the one on the right, they're analog. And so I didn't do any, you know, it, I haven't done any, I can't do anything with it. It is what it is. But I started to see, you know, faces in those two. And you can see that different lighting qualities, different moisture qualities produce, you know, it's in the same, same week and the same, you know, but different weather, different lighting. Next. And then um, it helped me to define the idea of, of abstraction um, in my work and that I like the idea of allowing people to bring to the work something that they wanted to see more of, that it wasn't me just, you know, I could label this something about a seahorse, but I could also label it something that leaves open an opportunity for someone to read something else, um, uh, something else. So what I started to do is I started to realize that I needed to leave some breathing space in my work and to allow um, the, the materials to show me what was there and to allow the viewer to bring the rest of it. And I think there's one more slide. And here's some more abstractions and there are three, three types of abstractions. And I started to think about um, these abstractions um, and that I started way back talking, uh, working with plant materials and taking better, very literal shots. And I moved into letting the work become less object based. And in that process, I found myself looking for animal forms, human forms, life forms. So in erasing the actual form, I've come back to wanting the dynamic, the one on the right, it's possible that that's two figures and they're in some kind of a dynamic uh, relationship or activity. Um, the one in the middle is, um, if you look closely, you might see a fish, you might see something that you, you know, the top, it might be part of an insect wing, but you'll look into that and there, you know, you'll, they'll see lots of multiple reads. The one on the far left uh, is an anal, I think it's an analog piece. And um, when that was shown in a gallery, when I came for the opening, it was upside down and it was shown that way. And I had submitted it and framed it the other way and it sold. But um, I was like surprised at why a, installer would do that but there it is you know I guess they were helping me and that one is my you know of the three the most abstract piece but some you know it's more um, uh, non-objective so as I said in my abstract work I'm looking for human form and dynamics and that's a wrap for my presentation and so look again, there's the original piece in the show. You might not see birds, you might see something else. And I'm open for questions.
Thank you so much, Sharon. I really enjoyed that. Does anybody have any questions that they would like to uh, ask Sharon? Well, Heather, I, I see your hand up. Yeah. Well, I'd like to know where I could buy sheet film and the fiber paper. Okay. Um, if all else fails, uh, there's Bow Photo in Vancouver, okay. and they'll ship to you. Okay. And it might take a while. I mostly buy my stuff from something in New York called B and H Photo, and I just pre-sign a waiver for you know the a brokerage will take care of it for me, so I don't have to have a guy at the door and I need a credit card. Um, and so they'll handle all the 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 details about you know crossing the border for products that are taxed or something. Um, so that's, and I don't know in Victoria, um, I've just started working with Carousel Camera and um, they don't carry much, but they will bring stuff in. Okay. But, but Bo Photo is great to work with there in Vancouver. And um, B&H is of course the, the supreme place for um, getting anything you need for photography. Um, any other questions at the moment or comments? Um, Terry, I have a comment. Debbie, I'm just sort of blown away because I've never heard the word pareidolia before. Oh, you talked about it on CBC this morning. No <laughs> way. <laughs> I was like, oh my God, this is like deja vu. <laughs> <laughs> and you described it just the way it was described. <laughs> Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, that's I was funny. really neat. <laughs> um, I, I'd love to make, I jump in with a comment. I really like uh, what you had to say about leaving breathing space around a piece, giving time to, to allow the, the, the work to talk to you and, and the opportunity that, that gives you to really look at it again. We were talking last night with uh, Rose Kama Morrison and, and she described the term as slow looking. Yes. much like slow food and and all of that and I really like that concept of slow looking going back again and again to to look at a piece and really let it develop and 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 speak to you for what it really wants to be I appreciate that so thank well, you for bringing that up uh, well thank you for making that connection <clears throat> well I'm looking forward to a workshop I'm me too <laughs> well I had signed up for the one at the Shadbolt Center just when COVID struck and I almost went, but I ended up not. I haven't even been anywhere hardly at all. But and then, then they had a back. workshop with Coast Collective and Coast isn't doing workshops yet either. So. Isn't it gone? Pardon? I thought it was closed. It is, but they're looking for trying to find ways to bring back some of what they had before. Oh. And it's still on the drawing board. Well, I'd like to be on your list somehow. <laughs> okay, yeah. <laughs> well, that's a, that's a good question. Um, if people are interested in um, learning more from you, Phyllis, what, uh, you must have a website and things my, like that. My website is at the end of that. Oh, I don't know if my website is in my write-up, but sassamat, S-A-S-S-A-M-A-T-T.com. <laughs> and that there's a place where you can contact me. Or my email is ps at telus.net, which is easy to remember. Mm -hmm. um, but right now, as I said, until I can find a, a organization or a venue or a course that wants to start having people uh, do this stuff, uh, I'm frustrated too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Well, fingers crossed that soon something will come up like that. And yeah, yeah. Be a little bit freer to, to do things and meet together again. But uh, Cedar Hill Community Center has a huge thing. Sorry, you're a bit quiet. Is there a way to go louder? Okay. Is, there, is there a way for you to turn that up, Heather? I can't. Can you hear me? Cedar yeah, now, now I can, yeah. Cedar Hill Community Center. They have a huge art room and they have an enormous sink. So it might be one idea. So what's the name? Senior Cedar Hill. Cedar Hill. Center. Cedar Hill. Okay. It's at Finless and, and Cedar Hill. All right. That's great. Good good information sharing here. I appreciate that.
Oh, and then there's the other one. Oh dear, what's it called? It's the old schoolhouse that they converted into an art gallery. In, in Sydney. Oh, in Sydney, there's one in Qualicum Beach. Is it the McTavish Art Center? Yeah, McTavish. Oh, Debbie. Okay, thank you. Yeah. They like water. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much, Phyllis. That uh, that was really interesting, and I think eye-opening for a lot of us. I'm really um, impressed with the work that you've done and and how it's come about to you. I appreciate that. So, thank you for. Thank you for. Thank you. Um, Thank you very, very much. It's oh, you're very welcome. Um, uh, just a couple of uh, follow-up notes. Um, uh, we've got some more talks coming up this week that you might be interested in. Uh, tomorrow night is um, it's called What's It All About? And uh, Bob Leatherbarrel is, uh, is quite a well-known glass artist who lives on Salt Spring Island. And he's talking about, um, he addresses, as he says, the age-old question um, of what's it all about by describing his background and his influences, what, what's got him to where he was. And he reveals his transformation into, or from the corporate culture to his creative passion. So that could be pretty interesting as well. And then on Tuesday, Susan Purney Mark talks about her piece called Along the Fraser, which is a, a fabric piece and part of a, a much larger um, art series that she's got a, going on talking about the industrial shorelines. Um, and then on Wednesday, we have another photographic one called Turning Photographic Caterpillars into Butterflies by Craig Harris. And he talks about the transition from an original photo to uh, something of a final product um, using uh, much like you do um, Photoshop elements, Nick, um, Filter Forge to find the artistic merit in things. So if you're at all interested in those, um, please do register through our, through our online um, events page. There, there are a bunch of uh, a number of um, other talks that are happening there. So, so yeah, thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank right. you both. All right. Take care. Thanks. Bye for now. Bye bye. Bye.